Uh, well, I think uh, first of all, I would like to promote a um, doctoral dissertation made by Apollonia Schusterschick. I think it's one of the very, very few doctoral dissertations that has been made about the relationship between the artist and the public artwork. And uh, I would recommend you all, if you're interested, to download it from our webpage. Or if you want to have this paper version, just call uh, Malmö Art Academy and you will get it for free. Um, this, is, this is only a documentation from the show that was connecting to, to the Hushta Inshallah, uh, Apollonia's dissertation. I don't know if Apollonia is here. She said she might be coming. Ah, good. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I would like to shift a little bit the emphasis now from um, conflict, from um, the perspective of the artist, and talk a little bit about the role of what's happening between the public and the public artwork. And um, as those who know me knows, uh, I'm very, very fond of the thinking and writing of Hannah Arendt. And Hannah Arendt has actually been writing a few things about this, then going back to Immanuel Kant. And by doing that, she noticed a few interesting, maybe self-evident, but nevertheless interesting, I think, aspects of this complicated topic. Because uh, um, although we heard Jens Horning <laughs> right now, I think it is quite unusual that an artist wished to provoke through her or his art. Um, I think it is uh, what's happening is something else when art is actually working in a provoking way. It might not always be um, the wish from the artist to do so. Sometimes, of course, it's there, but since the relationship between the artwork and the audience is enormously difficult to prescribe from the artist, you might also have a situation that the artist really wants to provoke, but there is absolutely nothing coming out of it. Um, so on one hand, we have this. On the other hand, we might say that in the modern role, and maybe not modernist, but modern role of the artist, you would say that it's very difficult for an artist to try to work in order to please other people's expectations. Uh, and it's here the clashes are coming, I think. When the clashes between the public uh, and the artist occur, it's often because there are unfulfilled expectations. The public expects something from the artwork, which the artist is not at all interested in fulfilling. And the artist wants to do something that the audience or the public is not interested in, quite simply. I'm only talking now about public artworks in public space. I don't talk about exhibitions or temporary installations or anything like that. Um, then on top of this, there is an assumption that art should be provoking. And I think this is coming as a leftover from the heydays of the avant-garde in the early 20th century. And even then it was often due, I think, to a misunderstanding. The artists show a new way of looking at the world, making art, and the public answered by throwing rotten tomatoes, as you know. And now there is some kind of still idea that if art is really interesting and good, it must be so provoking that people turn totally mad. And that is a kind of sign of quality in itself. And I think that this is really a leftover from modernist heydays. Um, but it, there is, of course, a problem with public art, and that is that it is public. It takes place in the public space among people who maybe have absolutely no or very little interest in art. Uh, and uh, we might see, well, what, the, what the, is it coming from? Jens, you were talking about the monument. And of course, it was the monument. It was the monument who was placed as a way of uh, identifying a nation or a group or whatever it could be. It's supposed to celebrate events that is important for the collective. 
and the, under, the collective understanding of group belonging. Um, and if you will be able to make a monument, I think that the artist needs to be at least to some extent identifying with the group that you make the monument for, or at least know that group well enough that she or he will really be able to make a work which will function as a monument. And all of you who had read Hannah Arendt, you know how important she thinks it is that you have something which is keeping the people or a group or a nation or whatever it is together. She says that this is basically the role of art and then she's talking about literature mainly or stories, storytelling, which is for her very, very important. But uh, if when it comes to art, you have a similar function. And this monument thing is something which is difficult, I would say, for a contemporary art scene to really um, understand how are you able to do this. Um, and here I come with Immanuel Kant, because Immanuel Kant here made something really interesting. In the mid-18th century, when he, as a young philosopher was trying to understand what was this new thing called art. Uh, he's, he is saying this famous yes, is das Ding an sich, that is that you don't have an interest in art. You look at art without any interest. Uh, interest here means that you can use it one way or another. Uh, Kant even says that looking at art helps you to be less egoistic. Uh, but meanwhile, he was talking about das Ding an sich, and I think it's still there. When we are talking about the artist integrity as something completely self-evident, it's coming from Kant, and we should remember that, I think. Uh, he is also talking about something else, and that is sense, is communis, which means common sense. And what he thought was that people are shaping a group who are discussing and judging the artwork. And this is a way for a group to learn to um, celebrate its citizenship, one might say. Free citizens are judging freely, talking together with a common sense about what is good or bad about this art piece. So it was an enormously important aspect for Kant, was the census communis. And I think that when you come to a contemporary practice and you see so many interesting artists who are working with uh, projects such as Apollonia is doing and has been doing for many, many years. That is that you enter into a situation, you live with its citizens, you change something, uh, you create an art piece which is not maybe more a platform for uh, actions going on in this particular community. What these artists are doing is actually that they are going back to the idea of that somehow the artist should be part of the group or identifying her or himself with the group that is demanding or wishing for this monument. And when Apollonia was invited by uh, the city of Bochum to do one of these projects in a small uh, rundown suburb, as it normally is, Hustad, they thought a little bit vaguely, I think, upon... Uh, something that would be a monument, um, a sculpture or something, at the main square, which is called Brunnenplatz. And what Apollonia was doing was that she was actually spending, I think, almost two years in the community and building up a temporary pavilion as a kind of platform for anything that was happening during this long period in Hustad, which meant that she learned to know the people and she was using the possibilities of the actual inhabitants in the uh, city or in the suburb to develop the art project. The important thing was never, I think, the actual building, this temporary pavilion. The important thing was everything that was happening around it. And she was able to do that because she, in a way, partly came to identify herself with the inhabitants in this multicultural suburb uh, outside of Bochum. Um, and now it comes to... Let me continue here a little bit. Uh, there is, of course, difficulties with this also, because very often a city is actually asking uh, these artists to clean up or gentrify it around down suburb. 
Um, and for the artist, the line between being an activist, a social worker, or an artist is sometimes very, very thin. And I think Apollonia once expressed it as a dirty, flat-footed work. Um, but through the artists' interactions, I think, the inhabitants of Hustadt, coming from all these many different cultures and coming to Hustadt and Germany as migrants, maybe for the first time felt that they could form a group identity over which they could be proud. Uh, I mean that Schusterschick's temporary uh, pavilion functioned exactly in the same way as the traditional monument. It united and strengthened a particular group identity. And of course, you can say the emphasis is different. As we heard, it's a temporary pavilion. The actual monument wasn't the important thing. But it worked in exactly the same way as the traditional monument would do. Um, and then we might ask, well, what is coming out of this? What is left? If there is not a monument, if there is not the brick stones left there, what is left in the community? And here I think we have, again, a little bit complicated situation, because very, very often what is left is a documentation. And this documentation is shown anywhere in the art world, very, very often. Uh, maybe the place where it's not being shown is actually in the community where all this took place. Then uh, you might say that in the worst case, a project like this is using the inhabitants in a particular uh, suburb, or whatever it could be, as some kind of extras. They are actually making and shaping the art project, but then they don't have even a monument left when the artist is gone. But the other aspect, I think, uh, is, as I said, that through an interesting art project like this, uh, you could start to develop a sense is communis, a common sense in this very area, in this very suburb. And that is, according to Kant, the precondition for a citizen to act in a democratic society. Thank you very much.